Hello and welcome to Around the Lens, episode 134. I'm your host, David J. Murphy. With me, as always, are my co-hosts, Ron Hamilton and Zach Roberts. Hello, team. Hello. Hi, guys. Uh, Ron, what have you been up to the last week or so? Anything special? Uh, it's a sunny day in Hawaii, and I'm uh, I'm actually at the beach right now. You look like you're in your uh, room, in your uh Oh, wait. Your That's right. I'm, or whatever, I'm, I'm he's actually he brought his I should be down to the beach. And, I meant uh, to be at the beach, but I got a call to come on the show, so we'll do that instead. How old is the beach? Like, I mean, in terms of like, you know, you must be so over the beach by now, right? Like, you probably like no, sir. No, you go to the beach a the lot. Beach, the beach is like a beautiful woman. So never get gets tired old after time. Never get tired of it. Never let's, get let's, tired of guys, it, guys. As I said off air, let's let's continue. All right. <laughs> Ron always likes to push the, the envelope. Zach, anything new with you? How's Comic Con? Uh, uh, thanks for rubbing it in. Um, I didn't go this year. <laughs> no. Have no, you been no, to I, San Diego Comic Con? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I covered it uh, one or uh, two years. Um, but I cover. I'm kind of the East Coast photographer for uh, right. for ComicBook.com, uh, so I cover uh, New York Comic Con every year, which I I like a lot better. Uh, San Diego is just completely and totally insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love San Diego. I can't stand LA though. I'll never go back to LA if I can help it. I, I love San Diego as well, but during Comic Con, it is completely nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough to visit San Diego not uh, several times, not during Comic Con. So I actually, yeah, uh, managed to fall in love with the city. And yes, I, I, I universally despise LA. Um, so, so I, I nobody I, I walks do. in LA. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in LA. I did nothing but like walking and taking the public transportation. So, but anyways, I was a visitor. Um, okay. So you have you have been to San Diego Comic Con. I see the Russell. I see Russell's uh, post on Instagram. So he's always posting all these like panels with like actors and stuff like that. All behind yeah, this year I stuff. would have really loved to go. I actually usually uh, most of the guys that I know and 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 people that I like uh, it don't like they purposely skip San Diego because it's such a uh, uh, a cluster uh, of of madness. That, uh, mm. but uh, this year everyone decided to go. Mm. And of course, it's the one year I'm like, I literally posted a couple days. I never do this sort of thing, but I'm like, I really just want to go and I want to cover it and I want to hang out with some of the people that I know out there. If anybody yeah. wants to fly me out there, I'll give you a day or two coverage yeah. for free, yeah. um, or at least in, in kind. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, sadly, no, by then it's almost impossible yeah. to get press credentials. Yeah. Uh, press credentials to San Diego Comic Con is like a nine month long experience. It's easier to Thanks. it's easier to uh, birth a child than it is to get credentials there. Yeah. Um, so and the thing is, I mean, you can have a child on accident. Right. You can't get credentials to Comic Con on accident. Oh my goodness! <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we got a great show for you tonight. A lot of great topics to talk about. Some good news, some bad news. Uh, but the great news is we have Greg Locke back on the show from Canada. Hello, Greg. How are you? I'm great, guys. How are you guys doing? Doing good, doing good. Happy to have you on. Uh, how is it over there in Canada? Uh, it's actually hot for a rare day. So uh, and I'm just coming off a 10-day uh, a uh, international music and uh, sound art festival. So uh, I spent most of my days in dark theaters and sound booths and, uh, and that sound stage is so, you know, to be in there and then come outside into the heat is kind of a, a bit of a shocker. So. Yeah. All right. Well, glad to have you on. Glad to have you on. Anything? Uh, give the uh, the folks a little rundown of your bio, just in case they haven't heard you before. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I started doing photojournalism in the mid to late seventies. I did it pretty well, hardcore, mostly all national, international level stuff, uh, up for about fifteen, close to twenty years, and then kind of made the switch over to commercial, industrial work. And that's what I've been doing, you know, since about what, you know, 87, 88, pretty well straight wow. through. Awesome, man. Great. Well, glad to have you on. We got a lot to talk about tonight. And I want to start it off with a topic that you suggested. Um, and, and that's basically social media tools and how best to utilize them. Um, so, you know, what are some social mm -hmm. to media tools you recommend and how would you best utilize them? So, you know, when we first started talking like months ago about stuff, I began to think about all the things that photographers talk about. Yeah. So uh, because I got a I'm like 
way out on the east coast of Canada. We got a natural connection with a lot of the British uh, uh, photographers. So I'm in a couple sure. of discussion groups with those guys. And, you know, universally, they're all ex-newspaper photographers who have, you know, the jobs are disappearing or the work isn't there anymore. And so you sit around in chat groups and they moan and complain. Uh, I mean, a lot of them move on to, to other things and there's always work for good photographers. But a lot of them talked about, oh, yeah, what a waste of time Instagram is. What, how do you make Facebook work? Uh, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I begin to realize how... Um, you know, almost like every photographer approaches the social media differently. And, and there's some who thinks that, well, I'm going to throw everything up on social media and I'm going to get lots of work. And then there's people who use it strictly as a bit of a portfolio. And there's some who use it as a travel log. Yeah. Um, but, but overall, uh, I think a lot of people uh, expect a lot more out of it than, than what they actually get. Yeah. Uh, particularly from, you know, the more traditional or older photographers who, who might not be the 20 something who was born and raised into Instagram, you know? Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoy it to a point. Uh, I think you need it to a point. Uh, how, what you put up is really important the content. And once I gave up thinking that this is going to be my new marketing tool and just went straight back to thinking, well, you know what? I got into photography to show pictures to people yeah. and tell stories. Sure. Once I got back into just thinking it as just a publishing platform, uh, uh, then I was much happier and I stopped worrying about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I constantly think, you know, if I really wanted to take advantage of something like Instagram, I mean, it's less so about posting what you want. It's more about posting what is popular and trying to ride the trend of, uh, trendiness or, you know, what's like sort of hot right now and, you know, featuring kind of focusing your, your content on that in an effort to, of course, raise attention for yourself, raise awareness, raise followers, and then use that sort of, you know, uh, attention capital, exposure capital, exposure bucks uh, to essentially leverage yourself for more work that actually pays. Have you have you had that experience? But you said you said you're not focusing uh, on it. you're just you're just throwing stuff on there and letting whatever happen happen. So you don't necessarily yeah. you don't you don't focus on Instagram. You just post stuff onto it. Yep, I do. Um, basically, I do my thing and I treat Instagram. Uh, I don't have a. I closed down my Facebook business page because okay. it was. It was it was functionally worthless yeah. because, frankly, we are our brands. People aren't going looking for something. They're just looking for us if they want it. So I just treat my my even my personal Facebook page as just a business page, really, right. and post uh, post my own stuff. I, I posted something the other day on Instagram, and it was shot uh, in rural Newfoundland outside small fishing village. This handmade boat. My daughter was there in her summer dress, and it was like it was the most Instagrammy photo I ever took. <laughs> you know? But it was a cool shot. So um, yeah, I um, Instagram has worked for my daughter because she's 17 and she's like I say a, a fledgling pro athlete, and it's attracted a couple of sponsors for her. Wow. Uh, I've gotten. I can honestly say I've gotten two jobs <coughs> on Instagram. One really? was from Sony Mobile, and one was from the North Face. Now, they weren't big jobs, but they it, it did what I was doing got their attention. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I don't have a ton of followers, but what I do is all original content, and it's not it's what I do. It's like uh, you know, right on top of the Instagram page, it's like this is what I am, this is what I do, this is my work. It's not, sure. uh, and and it's pretty well always. Most of it is outtakes from my actual assignments, you know, yeah. oh, and it's a little bit of a travelogue in between because the running joke with all my friends is that, you know, never fly on the same day that Greg flies because your flights will be delayed or canceled. <laughs> so, you know, there's a running joke through my entire Instagram feed about, you know, being trapped in an airport somewhere. So right. um, I was I was much happier once I turned it into me telling my story the same way I did when I was in newspapers. Because, you know, here in, well, even in Toronto, which was a pretty big city, and I worked for the Sun, which was a big tabloid, right. you know, it was still, in many ways, it's a big city, but it's a small community. Sure. And, uh, you know, when when you get people like calling you or leaving messages or something saying, you know, we really love that photo, or yeah, we saw your work, you realize it brings you right back to why, we as photojournalists do what we do. It's basically we take pictures to show other people the world around us. That's what it comes down to. Right. We don't take pictures to 
you know, that's the primary focus. It's not to get more followers on Instagram or on Facebook or, or whatever. So, uh, once, you know, when I, when I realized that, hey, you know, there's a number of people out there, you know, there's not a million of them, but there's some that actually want to see your work and this is a venue to show your work, then that's, that's the way to go. And I'm much happier now than the people who are trying to make Instagram work for them. Right. Uh, I just I just treat it as you know a personal publishing platform. But once you say that people are maybe making Instagram work for them, or getting more followers, which is attracting more attention, which is leading to more jobs. I mean, you, if you I were able to get so. if, if you were able to get jobs with a, a few hundred followers, like you have, you have seven hundred and twenty six, according to this recording. Uh, I'm also a <laughs> follower. Uh, but uh, you know, do you think you know if you had double, triple, quadruple that you know number? You would get well, what is, getting more attention. I don't know. I, I think I got the Sony stuff because I had a Sony phone. I use Sony phones, and I travel a lot, so I okay. post a lot of stuff from all over the place. Yeah, uh, you know, Jamaica, Vancouver, mountain climbing, sea kayaking with their phones. That you know, at, at some point, somebody in their marketing department, oh, look at that, right? That's interesting. And the other thing that if you see the Instagram feed, probably, you know, two thirds of every shot there is mountaineering or rock climbing. So uh, naturally, um, you know, that community is very in- engaged on Instagram. So that's how I picked up the North Face thing. Yeah. So but other than that, like I don't I, you know, on Facebook, I mean, there might be 600 people there, followers, whatever, uh, maybe one or two are clients. Right. So what's the what's the point of putting it out there, you know, if if your clients aren't there, you know, uh, if if you know your clients are uh, are Instagram followers and that you have stuff to sell them, yeah, absolutely work it so that you're you know you're tagging them with stuff and making sure that you get your stuff in front of their eyes. Right. But uh, if if none of your clients are on there, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. So Facebook is a non-starter. Instagram is where you focus on. What about other social media platforms? Are you using the YouTube? Are you using um, Snapchat or anything else? Uh, no, not using YouTube uh, because there's nothing worse than crappy video. <laughs> and, you know, it's I just I just can't bring myself to do cheap video. You know, it's like if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. And then well, what do you, you know, find as cheap video? I think anything I, – I think once you've worked in, in broadcast, in TV, or if you worked in any film at all, your production value standards go way up. And uh, I can't – I don't even watch videos on YouTube anymore. Uh, just like – I'm sorry. If you can't hold a camera steady, you know, I'm not watching your video because, at the very least. I mean I would say I agree with you. I mean I don't want to watch somebody's shaky, blurry, out-of-focus garbage any either. Mm-hmm. But you know, you see a lot of – uh, trending YouTubers who are, you know, have high quality cameras, shoot high quality footage, and you know, create high quality vlogs and, and other video features very quickly. And you know, I would say their Absolutely. production levels are, you know, up there. Um, you you don't think you could reach that sort of same pinnacle of production in the in the time that they have to kind of edit? Probably for me, because video is not my primary technical area it okay. is stills and and uh you know it's not equal for me or right, right. you know for video is still so uh when i when i'm shooting video it's always tends to be a big production and I, it's just that i don't i don't think in those terms unless i'm actually shooting video yeah, yeah i know a young woman she comes from a small town not far from here and you know she works for uh, uh much music which is the canadian version of mtv mm. uh and she has a youtube channel and she makes six figures off that a year so wow. yeah it's doable it's absolutely doable yeah if 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 you can if you can find that niche that you can rack up a million viewers yeah that's so been my very thing. niche it, yeah you're right i mean i mean that's all niche you know that's all youtube is is niches and you grab onto your niche and suddenly you have a couple million subscribers if you know how to leverage your niche. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, of course, we had a friend on at the show a few weeks back, um, and, you know, he has a YouTube channel, which he's growing, and, you know, I haven't checked it recently, but he's about 300 subscribers, so that's not bad for starting at the, you know, around the beginning of the year. Um, and he'll probably be in profit territory by the, you know, by this time next year. Uh, but I was just curious, yeah, if you can't edit video quickly, if you can't, you know, shoot and edit video 
in a timely manner because that's what all YouTube is about is getting video out in a quickly, you know, quick, quick manner. And if you can't do that, if that's not your forte, then yeah. Like for instance, I take forever to edit my videos and I'm, I'm not, I'm extremely bad at it. And it's just, you know, and plus I, I, I probably would need a better newer computer to edit video at a, a rate that would be, um, you know, adequate for uh, YouTube considering I shoot everything in 4k. Uh, my MacBook, can, <laughs> my MacBook can handle it barely. Uh, but yeah. you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of complicated video editing. It's not, you know, I don't really have any effects. It's mostly just, you know, cutting, cutting up a, a piece of video into a cohesive narrative, which is, which is fine for most of what YouTube wants. You know, YouTube doesn't want, you know, they aren't, you know, they're not going there for the polish. They're going there for the, uh, the texture as they say. Um, so it doesn't necessarily <laughs> have to be the highest of highest production quality, just as long as it's, you know, sounds good and looks relatively good. Most people are okay with that. And, you know, you see a lot of stuff that has a little bit of roughness around the edges. And even then, you know, people tend to, to like that kind of stuff, you know, as opposed to being super slick. Uh, guys, yeah. uh, what, what are you up to in social media land, uh, Zach, Ron? I, I just I just add on to, to uh, what Greg was saying. I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the important things, especially is, uh, if you're a photographer, if you're a ph- photographer, we're all, all photographers, I think these days are probably also a little bit of video videographers as well, whether we like it or not. Um, but I, I've tried a dozen times to try to start up a YouTube channel or what, you know, it's kind of like start doing things more, uh, even for my own work, not even for paid work. Like I'll do basic video interviews during, uh, for news pieces. Uh, but that's literally kind of half the justification, like to, you know, be like, Oh, I'm going to go here. I'm going to, I have to do these interviews anyway. Um, so I'm going to film them. Like I have to do them for the, for the news piece that I'm going to write. So I might as well film them and then I'll be able to just, you know, not only charge a little bit more then probably a lot of places will be like, well, you're just going to give me 10 stills and 600 words then, you know, um, but, uh, but I, I find I, I, forget who I've heard this recommendation for when it comes to social media. I mean, you, there's so many different sites and there's so many different ways to come at it, whether at, for a photographer, um, and you just kind of have to find out what works for you, what you're able to do, what you like best. And, you know, for me, it's less weirdly less Instagram. I find like photojournalism doesn't really do that well. Like even some of the best photojournalists, unless it's like National Geographic or something like that, they don't get a lot of attention. You know what I mean? Like I know some of the best photojournalists in the world, friends with them on, on Instagram. And, you know, we both kind of have about the same amount of likes and which I find frustrating. You know, you have some, you have Kim Kardashian or whoever, you know, out there with 8 billion likes and five, you know, the, the entire universe following them. Um, but, you know, I mean, and some people, I know a lot of younger journalists um, who, uh, Snapchat is just, they know, they have figured it out. I personally barely know how to turn it on. Um, and I've tried to have my, my teenage sister explain it to me a dozen times. And I'm still just like, I just, I finally have reached the point where I'm old. Like when it comes to technology, <laughs> Snapchat is the thing. Like, I, sure. I, I, you know, it's like, I know how to video edit. I've evolved all along with the thing, but for some reason, Snapchat, I just don't understand. I don't understand Instagram stories. I don't understand the point of them. I get that. I get why they do better because of algorithms that Instagram wants them to do better. You know, it's kind of like Facebook, Facebook wanted video for a little while. So I tried to do more video. I tried to do more live video and that did okay. Like, you know, I think my top one has like maybe a couple thousand views, uh, on something that I did, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, my political news coverage or commentary or whatever. Um, but I think it comes down to, I figured out that Twitter is best for me. Like still, you know, my photos do really well on Twitter. When I, when I post them there, I just have to remember to watermark them because Twitter has the Twitter probably more than anywhere else. You, other than maybe like Reddit, you post a photo there and it's gone. Like it yeah. is, it is out to the world and you will only find it once your copyright lawyer <laughs> gives you calls. <laughs> um, it's but, interesting that Twitter works for you because I, I've, I've got a Twitter account. I've got yeah. uh, a bunch I, of followers, I get, but I, I, I get nothing. I'll, I've done experiments where I've taken yeah. the same picture and posted natively on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram. And, 
like absolute death on Twitter it's, and everything it's, else picks up fine. Twitter, the, the thing with Twitter, it's really good. It's one of the few platforms that's good for political photography or photojournalism. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not, I, I don't know, other than maybe some like National Geographic, National Geographic, like the, that kind of world of photojournalism where you're taking, you know, really cool photos of animals and things like that kind of do okay everywhere. It does best. I see, I see that it does best on Instagram. It does, it does okay on Twitter, but Twitter is all about the moment. Um, because literally you post something and it's gone. Um, and, and it's, it's, you know, five billion tweets have gone by. Like I, I finally now I post a photo of, I did it exactly at the right moment. I got lucky on every shape, way, shape, and form, and I got you know twenty thousand likes on it, and I don't know how many shares or whatever it was, um, or actually it was twenty thousand retweets and you know a uh, couple and like you know fifteen thousand likes or something on a photo from Charlottesville, and it hit every single like necessary thing for a social media photo or news yeah. story to do well um, because at that point, and that's the that's the problem with Twitter as well as a as for not only for news, but especially for a photojournalist or a photographer in general, is that there, there are certain times within a news story that it will do well. Like it's the be- very at the beginning, maybe at the end when people are still talking about it. Um, but, you know, I mean, then there's times like I, I still don't know how I posted my photo um, from Charlottesville um, uh, so Saturday. It would have been Saturday night. Um, and I'm shocked that it did so well because Saturday night is death when it comes to news. That's kind of when it's almost, I, for me, it always seems like it, that's when entertainment stuff is doing well. Cause I also work in entertainment journalism. So I see like that when those things trend. Um, yeah. but it's, it's all, it, it's with social media. It's, it's so much luck. I find, um, it's knowing having really good work obviously helps, but at the end of the day, it's not, you know, it's not everything. I mean, I'm sure we all go by, we all go through Instagram and find this amazing photographer who has like 12, 12 followers and, and, you know, <laughs> and it's not yeah. anything. And you're like, how are you, you're doing this with your phone? Like what, what what's going on? Why aren't you having, and, and, you know, so, I mean, it just ends up being luck and the right person finding it. I find it's not, a, it's kind of a social media platform. The best thing for getting work, at least again, within photojournalism uh, is Blink. Um, really? it, uh, the blink app. Um, I've only gotten like, I've gotten two jobs out of it, but a bunch of like almost jobs, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it just, I was too late to answer. I was too, whatever it's, you know, either my fault, the editor's fault, story dropped or whatever people lost it, you know, sort of thing. But, uh, you know, I mean, I got to just by the fact I live in Syracuse, New York, which, uh, you know, you live in Newfoundland, you know how it is when it comes to news stories. They're short yeah. and far between. <laughs> when, I just had they, this conversation like, with Reuters about uh, about contracts, and I said, I said, I do job, one job a year for you. How is this like? Why, <laughs> you know, why do I bother? Tell me why I bother to do this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I mean, I, I just I, I lucked out, and you know, and um, I have all my information on Blink. Um, it's the Blink app. It's on Android and. Uh, uh, and iPhone. Uh, if you're a photojournalist or you're a photographer looking into it, highly recommend getting the app. Just keeping it on. It tr- it tracks your location, so that's just something you should know. Um, you know, if you're doing that sort of thing, but it tracks your everything location, tracks so your location so that, nowadays. Well, no, but, but this yeah. this one is the one of the very few ones where you actually kind of want it to, because so you don't have to automatically like. Sometimes I'll be like, oh crap, did it? Did I have to go in and check when I'm in a new town and covering a news story because you'll you'll get phone calls. You're gonna even less so than because in. Instagram, I usually only post my finished edits on. Um, so, and Twitter, I maybe cell phone photos, and people don't necessarily identify you as a photojournalist. If you, you know, for me, like my cell phone camera isn't really that amazing anymore. It's got probably scratched up enough. But, um, uh, but with Blink, you get um, they know your location and it updates your location. So, if somebody's looking for a photojournalist that's in that area, they'll be able to just editor photo editors will be able to look at it. And go, okay, Zach is in this area. That's the only, I got a five or six day job with the Daily Mail covering a stupid, (laughs) stupid local news story. Um, and that was my biggest job the last six months. Um, it, you know, it was, it was fantastic. Um, it wasn't normally what I'd cover too. Like Daily News has only bought my photos 
the only time they ever bought my photos were from Charlottesville, and they literally have never. I don't even have them buying stuff from my wire ever. Um, so, like, no, I mean that's how it just they, you know, yeah, um, pretty random. So, yeah, no, it was just very random, but it turned out to be one of the biggest. It literally is probably still going to be one of the biggest stories I've ever covered in my life because wow. it's one of those stupid viral stories. It was the story about uh, um, uh, the the kid who got evicted from his home. Oh uh, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I have all the stills from that are by me because there's only one <laughs> other photographer. Um, yeah. who Wait, he was from the Post uh, News. I think he was from the Post, but. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no. So, I mean, like that, that's really worked out. Everything else is just, you know, I, I use Zenfolio for my portfolio site, which is where I get 95% of my people buying stuff. I don't know how Zenfolio's search works or whatever, but it seems to work really damn well because like, again, my, I mean, Charlottesville is my biggest catalog stuff and, yeah. uh, I've gotten probably a dozen dozen really big, you know, uh, I mean, not really big payouts, but like really big, uh, publications and things like that, like, you know, frontline and, and, and different places buying it from me, which is fantastic as opposed to my wire, which, you know, yeah. they can get. For cut. Yeah. But I mean, if they want others, I, I'm a, I'm a really bad on my portfolio, which everyone yells at me. I upload, like I have 400 photos from Charlottesville in, in <laughs> uploaded so they can see yeah. everything. But I have yeah. things other people don't upload. So, you know, like the Getty photographer isn't going to upload 400 photos from an event. I uploaded damn everything and they're edited and ready to go. <laughs> so, but yeah. 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 But anyway, that's my super long rant on, on my social media when it comes to Photoshop. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one way to be popular on Instagram or other platforms is to do something controversial so that <laughs> it gets attention and goes viral. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if this was intentionally designed to draw attention, but uh, uh, it drew someone's attention, Zach's attention. Uh, we oh had a God. photographer by the name of Alessio Mamo, uh, a yeah. freelance photographer based out of Italy, who decided to do a rather, I would say, uh, perhaps insensitive photo story piece where uh, she photographed starving, poor folks, or Elixir, you know, again, judging by the photos, these are, you know, poor folks who, you know, uh, live in the most impoverished country on earth based on her captions. And she puts uh, a table with a red tablecloth and fake food. I thought that was the best part. Because first I thought, oh, real food. Okay, well, at least at least they're getting some food. And then I found, no, it's fake food. Put yeah. a table with fake food it, in front it, of these people. It's and they're he, all, by the way. Alessio is a he? Uh, Mamo okay. is a he. Yes, yeah. yeah. That fact. Sicilian photographer focuses, uh, according to um, uh, his bio on uh, Instagram, he focuses his photography on social and political issues. Um, and I recommend checking out his work. His work otherwise is, is quite fantastic. Um, and it's one of those, I think it's just one of those stories that probably sounded... I don't know how it could sound good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I don't know how at all, uh, mm -hmm. unless you're completely and totally disconnected from the way that world, the world reacts to things. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's kind of an unbelievable photo series because it's not just one photo. It's a, a photo series, um, that, you know, put out fake food, ask the, ask the children or family members or whatever to cover their face and then dream of what, um, uh, their, uh, what was it? Con conceptual project about, uh, uh, about hunger. Um, these photographer, uh, photographs are from Uttar uh, Pradesh, um, two of the poorest states in India. Um, and, uh, I brought, I brought with me a photo. Uh, this is the, from, from his, one of his Instagram, uh, captions. Uh, I brought with me, a table and some fake food. And I told people to dream about some food that they would like to find on their table. And it's technically a fine photo. Um, and, and I've seen, I, I don't know if you guys remember, I think it was Nat Geo that had they that at least they bought the photos and they used them a lot. There was, uh, you know, all the food that people eat, in this community. And so you'd have this family sitting down in front of basically all the food that's in their kitchen, mm -hmm. um, just laid out in front of them. And it was fascinating. It was a fascinating, like, look at what people actually eat in an area, you know, yeah. because like you'd had, you had, 
you know, rich white families, you had middle class white families, you had African families, you had European, you know, Asian, all, all over. And they were, you know, very nice portraits of the family. And it was just kind of a, they didn't, ha it wasn't like a super in-depth thing. It was just an interesting Nat Geo style, like, let's look at this sort of thing. And, and, you know, we were discussing on email before this about how if this was a conceptual art piece, then maybe it's something, but like it's, con it's a concept project. It's a conceptual project that the way that they describe, uh, that, uh, Alessio describes it. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to, I, I <laughs> cause I, 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 I crap on, I, I crap on photographers sometimes when they come up with really tone deaf things, but none of his other work shows this. And right. so it's so out of league. It's not a, you know, if this was a vice magazine, um, photographer, a, you know, 22 year old hipster trying to figure out things, you know, from Brooklyn, I'd be like, okay, whatever, throw, you know, throw them under the bus or whatever. But there has to have been some, thought process here that we're all missing <laughs> well i was wondering too is i wonder if he paid them anything to be in the photo if he fed them if he if he did something good and then i i, I don't like the photos i think it was off mark i think um what i don't know the guy's intentions when he shot this stuff i don't i don't know i, I wasn't there uh i would not have done it this way uh yeah. however um, how would you have done it ron <laughs> would you have used a blue tablecloth instead of a red tablecloth <laughs> Would you have used Strictly real food instead of fake food? How would you? I, mean, I, I at least would have used real food and then yeah, had the, right. like, no, and had the idea. meeting. Or so, like have like a this montage and be like, what is your idea. dream photo? Here, what is your dream food? And then they open up their yeah, eyes and, oh, my God, food. their dream yeah. dinner is there. It's, you know, a Happy Meal or something, you that know, whatever it is. <laughs> Do you know the logistics of getting a Happy Meal out to that location? Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> that was sad. It would no be so cold by the time it got there. You know, they wouldn't want that anyways. Be like, these fries are cold, man. So, so you know, before we get into discussion, I uh, you know have to bring out the whole thing. So, the outrage from it um, on social media, which is the tie-in, um, is uh, is not even so much at the photographer because I think that we're all just as confused as we all are about the intentions, and we don't want it. It's so out there that we it's one of those like. I ha we have to be missing something. It's, you know, it's, it's almost like a Donald Trump tweet. Um, but, uh, no. <laughs> uh, but, uh, the, the fact that, uh, this was done on, uh, the world press photo Instagram, uh, page during a account takeover, you know, when you have you invite a photographer to come in and, and post on, on larger pages so they get better, so they get more attention. Um, uh, Alicio, and again, uh, Apologize if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Uh, won uh, the 28 uh, was awarded 20, uh, second prize in People Singles for his uh, for a portrait that he did a, um, a victim of a missile explosion in Kirkuk, uh, Iraq, which is a really amazing black and white portrait. Um, and uh, the photo contest winners were given the opportunity to take over the Instagram page for a week. Um, and the the weird thing is is that. And I guess that this was one of the last um, uh, Alicio's takeover uh, started on July 16th and ended on uh, 20, uh, 22nd of July. Other than his portrait of Manal, none of the other uh, photographs Alicio shared were awarded prizes in the photo contest. So basically, they're trying to back off from from them. And anyone who's followed this podcast or followed photojournalism in general knows that World Press Photo Foundation, their awards have a long kind of problem of whether it be edited photos, set up photos and kind of weird things. And so they posted a whole thing on, on their, uh, on, on medium as just a, here's what, here's, it's all his fault <laughs> basically, which is most of what I read to you. And then a like real press photo guidelines of what, you know, they should do it as if like, you know, they just handed the, their account over to him and said, have at it. Uh, I don't believe, as a person who r has run social media accounts before, I, I can't imagine trusting anyone, including the guy who I run social media pages for, with <laughs> just being able to upload anything to social to our social media pages. 
Okay. Like I would never, I, I don't even allow me and the other person who runs, uh, one of the guys I work for, uh, social media, uh, like Twitter page. He doesn't know his password for, to Twitter for a reason because he'll <laughs> post stupid stuff. <laughs> We're his, you know, his wall. And I feel like I, 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 I would, I would imagine if we did one, you know, we've done them past or whatever, like I would be like, ah, just show me the 10 photos you're going to share and cool. Like I just have to see them beforehand. Like it would, I would be idiotic. Like to see the rejected photos. Could you make a separate account? Well, I mean, if I mean, it was rejected. So I mean, it just to me, it's kind of irresponsible that they just passed it off on this on this poor photographer um, who you know. And again, you look at his catalog of work. He's a serious photographer. He is a deserved award winning photographer. Um, and this is again, this is a conceptual uh, project idea that hopefully was going to stay as a concept forever in eternity eternity, and never was going to go anywhere. I'm sure we've all thought of weird ideas of things to do and just never thought, well, I'm going to go and bring food out to the middle of nowhere, fake food and uh, photograph children with it. Um, I, I would hope that we do there. But so that's uh, like this story is still evolving. I think, you know, people who called out Alicio are already on Twitter going, I really hope Alicio's okay. Like, this is a really crap thing that's happened to him this day. Like, so social media has kind of already eat, eaten him, uh, digested him, and uh, now try to help him reform his life. <laughs> <laughs> so, which yeah, is a nice thing, because usually it's like, we're going to eat you, we're going to digest you, and then, we, well, we're just going to flush you down the toilet. So, <laughs> I'm really seeing that. But anyway, yeah. So, I think what happens is that uh, and I noticed this with a lot of artists, uh, especially uh, thinking of it now coming off of covering Sound Symposium, which is uh, a new music, uh, sound art, avant-garde, bleeding edge stuff that the artists and uh, lecturers and people who show up for this, these sound engineers, they are the best in the world. They're the best in their field. They played with all the major and recorded with all the major <laughs> musicians, classical pop. And what happens, I think, is that they get to a point where they've done everything, seen everything, created everything, that they're looking for something new. And I think sometimes they step off the edge and don't even know it. Uh, and yeah, and especially uh, you, know, you get somebody who is, a, like you say, a serious photojournalist who produced some serious documentary work. Uh, I think maybe... You get to the point where you've done it, and you've done it, you've done it, you don't feel you made an impact, and then you want to make this big art statement, and then it bleeds genres, and all of a sudden it turns to shit on you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's a little bit of that. It's, uh, I think, you, you know, what's the term? Jump the shark. But also, yeah. you know, I, I, can't, I can't blame him for trying to produce a piece of art that would have more impact, and I think it's just maybe he didn't have a real clear vision of what, what, it, what it would happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, what I thought too. Is yeah. like you know he built this piece for Instagram, for the platform that he was taking over, you know, in a way to garner you know kind of like thinking what would Instagram want to see versus what do I normally produce, you know. I mm. think that's kind of where maybe he thought, oh, I'll do something that's like interesting and edgy and you know perhaps uh, visually appealing, uh, tries to have a social commentary, and I think he just kind of overextended a bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I just. Quickly, I mean, uh, I, I I just blanked on what I was going to say. So uh, quickly, you, you can go to somebody else. But, Rob, oh no, quick. no, no! What? What? I'm sorry. What? What I was saying was to quickly bring up what what we were we were talking about right before we we went on went on air is that I, I think it's really advisable for everyone, not even to necessarily have a mentor, um, whether they be an equal in, in your life, um, but you need to have a check. You need to have somebody who is not necessarily the counter you and going to kind of like counter everything you say and question it or whatever. You have to be harsh. But like, you know, I, I, I write things and I, I work for mostly, you know, lefty progressive sites. Um, and so the language is always changing and, and the language is also very, very particular. And sometimes you use a word that six months ago was fine to use or a phrase or something like that and now is not. And that's difficult, but that's why it's important to have, I have a whole surrounding of people, of friends and colleagues who I go, Hey, 
Um, I'm going to write out this this phrase. Would it be weird to call um, this group of people this, or should I use this? Um, I mean, I used the example. I was writing a piece about a uh, um, uh, immigrants' rights group down in uh, down in Texas. I covered a story for them, and I'm, I have a, a photo spread in the Progressive magazine uh, in a month or two. And I was going to call them uh, the new Acorn, which Acorn was this uh, voting rights and and other thing group. Uh, social rights, uh, social activist group um, that uh, basically got uh, completely trashed by right wing, right right wing media. That James O'Keefe, you know, went undercover and claimed that he was prostitutes, and it was a whole scandal. And basically, the entirety of the Democratic Party just threw Acorn under the bus, and they were gone. And I, and so my big question was: A, does anyone know, remember who Acorn is, or what organization it is, um, and B? Would it be unfair and potentially give this group unwanted attention from, say, right wing groups that might want to try to go after it now uh, when it's this small, low budget, you know, literally Cesar Chavez and uh, help start the group <laughs> that, that I was that I was writing about. And I decided, thanks to a couple of my friends that all said it's probably not worth the comparison and the risk. Never mind. You know, a lot of people may not remember. the group, But. But either way, like I had a group of people around me that would say that would that would be able to tell me, I get what you're saying, but probably not the best idea. And I don't know if Alessio has that those people. And I think it's really important uh, for photojournalists, um, especially writers, but especially but also for photojournalists to have those people who you can privately share a photo, an idea, a concept or whatever to and go, this is a good idea um, and have an honest opinion. And it's also, but it's also equally important for you as a photojournalist or a photographer, or artist, whatever, to go. I accept that person's opinion <laughs> because yeah. there's a chance that he showed it around to a handful of people, and, and they all said, "Holy man, that's a bad idea!" And then he <laughs> said, "Oh, I don't care. I am an artist, and I like it." Um, and uh, but you know, again, that's all just adding intentions to this poor guy who's probably had the worst. <laughs> first day on social media that I wouldn't want to have. Well, say, Everybody I mean, needs an editor. Yeah. Well, in this yeah. case, wouldn't he have had the whole of World Press Photo? I mean, you know, no, I'm sure see, he didn't upload all these photos at the same the time, photo, right? Us and didn't. And clear their claim is that their claim seems to be that they didn't check what his photos were. He which, had the account, I mean, password find, or whatever. Yeah. Which I find completely ridiculous. <laughs> But either way, I mean, World Press Photo is a multi, I assume, a multi million dollar nonprofit organization. I mean, like, no organization that's more than a handful of people sitting around in folding chairs are going to just be like, oh, here's, here's our social media accounts. Um, you know, that's insane. Yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure there's somebody with a salary whose job it is to take care of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a, <laughs> evidenced by the fact that World Press Photo hasn't taken down the images, they don't. You know, they're not going to say, like, these weren't appropriate. You know, they're just saying, hey, this is the work of the guy. This is what the guy put out. He's responsible for his stuff. You know, we're hands off. And, you know, I have to imagine what if the photographer had done something, you know, more radical or more, you know, edgy and stuff. What if it was, like, nude women or something or nude people? And, you know, I mean. I mean, th that would be against their guidelines that they were. Right, like, against the media uh, posts. Yeah. I mean, against yeah, their guidelines. Uh, okay. But I mean, like, there's. I mean, I guess their guidelines keep it focused enough that unless you do, unless you post something like this that just is a really bad idea, um, yeah. not offensive in the ways that the like the terms of service <coughs> would, uh, you know, disallow. Um, it, it's it's fine, but it still seems like. No one had that conversation. There's a long process, even with digital photography. There's a long process mm -hmm. at which you go from concept to taking the, I mean, traveling to where you're going, buying the plastic fruit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so many points along the way where you go, this is going to be so cool. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like it seems like something I could think of in an afternoon and execute yeah. and later that day, you know, like. I mean, depending on your uh, no, no, proximity to fake food, it. you know, if you yeah, had a fake food like it. lying around because you did another shoot, okay, you just grab I mean, a table and a tablecloth so, and drive it out in, in the rural India. The only reason I'm saying this is that he's a, he, his bio says he's a Sicilian photographer, and this is this is very unfair. Like this is bad journalism we're doing right now because we're just going by like Instagram and bios just, and stuff right. like that. But he's a Sicilian photographer. He's in Italy. Like the photos are taken in India. 
Um, like he had to have packed a bag. I mean, I assume he bought the fake fruit in 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 Sicily. I don't yeah, know. The old you know, I mean, store. I'm just saying that there's that there's uh, you know um, that there's a long process at which that all of these things together. He had to buy the table. He thought about. I mean, if he's an artist, if he's a photographer, he thought about the about the tablecloth color. He decided on red versus blue versus white versus whatever. Um, you know, found this family that would agree to have their photo. It's just there's you know, it's not a it's not a photojournalism photo that just is a snap. I've taken photos before that I regret taking, and I haven't po- published them. You know, whether it be you know that that girl that just got hit by you know somebody at a protest and she's crying and it just looks it's just a miserable photo and i just decided no one no one learns anything from this photo i have a better one of a different angle or something like that like i have photos i, I keep bringing shots but i have like photos of people in a lot more pain and misery than i've ever published and i just won't publish them yeah. um because they serve no purpose yeah. other than yeah. disaster porn and um, this seems to be that sort of not disaster porn, but like poverty porn. You know, it's like you say we, we, we've had discussions about taking photos of homeless people before, you know, and and using it as art or street photography and things like that. I personally I just have no interest in that world of photography. There are people who do it well and, and have like an understanding and, and kind of can can give heart to those photos. But, you know. I, I, it's just not something that I yeah. either I'm capable of doing or if, but it's also just not a world that I'd go into kind of like this. Like yeah. I, this is not something I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have, I have a friend who's, who's really big in the street photography. He's, he was a good newspaper photographer. He spent 20 years at a small newspaper, but just, you know, wrapped up in that whole black and white street photography thing. And I said, you know what street photography is? It's photojournalism without a point, Colin. That's, <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> nice. I, pictures have to have a point. Um, yeah, you know, I see this, I see this photo series as insensitive and short sighted and shallow. But on the other hand, it's not like offensive. I mean, it, it is, it can be offensive. People can find it offensive. Absolutely. But it's not like, it's not disgusting. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, yeah. it's not vile. It's not putrid. It's just this one guy's idea of what he thought was artistically interesting. And it, it is interesting from a purely aesthetic point, but it is, it, you know, pretty insensitive and, and shallow, uh, in, in re- with regard to not shallow, but it's, it's insensitive and, uh, sh- you know, again, short sighted. So, I mean, you know, but at the end of the day, it's like, I'm not, I'm not like going to take arms yeah. against him. I'm just kind of just disappointed and, that someone would have this idea that is, you know, and, there's nothing coming out I, of this. And I think social media, again, I mean, this ends up being one of those social media stories that, you know, hopefully tomorrow, the next day to me, like, I think that this is one of the very few times that I've ever seen social media kind of doing it right, where the attention now is focused on world press, a allowing this to happen, B throwing the photographer under the bus. And, you know, and I think that that's the right response. Um, in the fact that if it was maybe even any other, if it was the Pulitzer foundation or somebody else, we could, it'd be more of a discussion, or it'd be a different sort of discussion, but it being world press who kind of has continually has this problem with this. Like they, they were the ones that had the right. I, they uh, the award winner that uh, had the set up cars where people were supposedly having sex in the cars and it was lighting. Oh, okay. It was a photographer's brother or cousin or something like that. Like it was set up and then they still argued whether it was a point. I mean, uh, I mean, it's the same, it's the same one that, uh, this year, uh, I think one of the big winners was uh, the um, from Venezuela, who the guy was set on fire, which is a fantastic photo, except the story behind the photo was he was set, trying to light a Molotov cocktail and he set himself on fire. And that's not what the story within the of the photo is. Mm. Um, and so, like, they have a long, long history of really screwing things up. Mm. And, like... <laughs> And so, like, this is kind of, I think now it's evolved into the correct thing, which is, what the hell is going on over in World Press Photo? <laughs> no idea. No I one has any idea. For, uh, World Press Photo sexing cars. I recommend putting Safe Search on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't have. Um, <laughs> Incognito mode, Ron. Incognito mode. Come on, man. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, oh, Zach. Oh, man. <laughs> 
All right. Well, you know what else is very popular on Instagram and also the web in general? Pictures of dogs and cute little animals. <laughs> so let's talk about the best dog photos of 2018. You know, closing up tonight's show on a happy note. Uh, pretty pictures of doggies. So this first picture here is a picture of a doggy. It looks so happy. <laughs> it's in midair. It looks like he's floating over some purple flowers. It's a pretty shot. <laughs> Are you going to share the photos, Dave? I'm, I, I am. Uh, if you, oh, are, you are, I am. Oh, okay, uh, we just can't see it. Okay, we can't see it. On you our can't. End. Right, we can't see it, but hopefully the viewers can. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you guys can go to the link that I sent you. But yeah. uh, right. anyways, so, you know, it's a, a lot of pretty pictures of dogs. Uh, Zach, you had a dog, didn't you? I still have a dog. Oh, you have a Why, dog. You're the second person like this week. I posted a photo of my border collie like sleeping next to her orthopedic pad. She's 14 years old. She has a very expensive orthopedic pad that she refuses to sleep <laughs> on. She'll rest her head on it or something like that. And then somebody posted on. I was on. I think it was on. Or it was on. Uh, it was on Twitter. Um, and somebody posted underneath it and was like, "Well, it looks like she knows her time is close." And I'm like, <laughs> "Jesus." Christ. Uh, no! Like, no! Uh, <laughs> like, don't kill my dog! Like, that's crazy. <laughs> she's going to outlive us all, I'm pretty sure of it, but just out of spite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but yes, I have a dog, and, and uh, like, sadly, she hates, she hears she the... Uh, sadly. No, wait, oh, she's still around. <laughs> I, I will fight you. I, will I thought you said you. you did lose a dog at one point. I lost a dog. Okay. <laughs> like I've I've had <laughs> multiple dogs over the years, um, but <laughs> Jesus Christ! So what do you think of these photos here of these dogs? <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. What do you think of these photos of these dogs? <laughs> uh, I mean, they're quite they're quite good. I mean, I mean, this is you know one of those things. You know, not only you know speaking back to Instagram. Uh, every single one of my photos of my border collie um, does better than any of my photojournalism work. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like if I tag a border collie, it's like at least it starts at 40 likes and it goes up, which like, you know, for photo, my photojournal, I don't have, I have like 800 people or something like that on Instagram, like, and no one interacts on my page at all. Yeah. So it's like, I get like 25 likes if I'm lucky, but if it's either that or my aunt's Irish wolfhound, um, who does really well, um, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're great photos. Um, I did, I wish I knew that this, this contest existed. I would have, uh, I would have, uh, I would have sent a couple, uh, even though I don't know, I don't know how your animals are, but, uh, uh, my border collie, the moment she see, if I go for a walk with her and I have my camera with her, she, the distance between us expands massively. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to take photos of my dog with a, with a telephoto lens. <laughs> And immediately she hides her face. Um, like she just hates having her photo taken, which I, I respect because, you know, I respect my dog's privacy. But yeah. um, <laughs> but but also I respect it being like, yeah, I get it. You, you grew up, you're 14 years old and you're you're done having your photo taken. I mean, you it's know, like having a teenage child. Don't put, yeah, don't yeah. put like that oh, from me. God. I feel so bad. Like, yeah, I, if I had kids, like that would be terrible. Like there'd be a certain point in age. I mean, Dave, your, your kids will get to a certain point where they're like, dad, if you take one more photo of me, <laughs> I know. swear to God, yeah. I'm going to take your Panasonic and mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Panasonic. Well, border collies are the sm smartest dogs. I must say that they are. <laughs> you have any, I, you have any dogs I, there, Greg? No, we don't have any dogs. We have two cats now. We had greyhounds for a while. That was kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, so uh, the day may come when a, a dog may enter the house. But, boy, uh, you know, I don't know if all you guys have ever had to do this in your life, but having to take a dog to the, the vet and get it put down is just oh, one of the most yeah. heart-destroying things ever, right? We yeah. don't need photos of that one. If you, uh, no, I know. We don't need that one. Yeah, I do that with that my dog, cat. Uh, yeah, that uh, that greyhound. It was uh, it was pretty funny. We got it when the girls were young, and uh, he was pretty docile. And there wasn't too many days I didn't come home, you know, and the girls would have a dress on him or a bow or a hat. <laughs> and he'd be he'd be in the living room, and they'd be making little videos of him, right? Yeah, <laughs> oh that's cute. god, poor dog. <laughs> making videos, editing on their YouTube channel. Probably got more subscribers than you do. I mean, <laughs> okay, when that happens. I know. Yeah, when your kids are better at it than you, it's ridiculous. That's right. 
Did uh, what about photos? Do you like take photos of your cats? Like yeah. you get the the, the high end glass, so you take some nice uh, cinematic I, shots of your cat, cats. <laughs> I don't actually. I don't. I mean, I have when you yeah. There's we have, we have one big tomcat, and he's just foolish, and he does all kinds of strange things. But it's uh, you know, I don't take pictures around the house. The the girls and my wife are the you know the official fa- family photographers. It's when I come in the house, the cameras get dropped and. Uh, just drop and nothing on gets cement on the floor. You know, there was a time, Greg. That's what YouTube was all about, was cat videos. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's still out there. There's still, there, I'm sure you can find a video or two of a cat. <laughs> it's uh, cute. I'm pretty sure dogs got a long way to catch up the cats on YouTube. Yeah. Eh. <laughs> depending, depending. Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I've done the photo a day projects, and when you're desperate to find a subject to take a picture of, <laughs> <laughs> your animals tend to be your easy go-tos. Like I got my dog in my office right now and he's, you know, she's so adorable. You know, I could grab my camera here, my, my Panasonic GH5. He's saying, no, I had Can one you imagine those. doing a concept photo of a dog with fake food in front of him? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh God. Way to bring it back, Ron. Way to bring it back. I think you need to do that and use it as the image for the, uh, for the archive. I think that I think that people would hate you probably more than putting food That's in front right. of children. That's one thing I've it's always. Painful, but I believe that. That's true. <laughs> like you get more you, hate you for think, that. Like I I uh, uh, it's re- this is a really dark thing, but uh, I haven't been able to prove it yet. I haven't been able to get documentation of it yet. But uh, when I was down covering the border crisis, uh, the latest border crisis and the you know children cages crisis um i uh, i was shown by a, a local a dog uh immigration um it was a i think it was a border border patrol facility it was a uh, a dog pen like they had a, a couple cages the dog pen and right next to it was an incinerator oh wow. yeah wow and supposedly what happens according to the person who told me again i haven't been able to document i haven't been able to confirm this so i literally haven't published or talked about it other than this uh but like when they cross over they most people can't take care of them they don't have a place to go and they have to go into quarantine quarantine so mostly what border patrol does or whoever it is that does it they put down the dogs and then incinerate them oh. um and uh, or cremate them or whatever it is but uh but yeah no so <laughs> that was like like literally i saw that story and i'm like this is the only story i could cover that would get more social media attention right. than literally children in cages because yep. if you add that story combined with the children in cages story people would probably run down to run down to the to the to the texas mexico border and start like physically ripping down the walls because <laughs> th- there's one thing that people care more about anything else it's puppies and kitties yep. and oh, yeah. a, Worked in nonprofit journalism and non and worked for nonprofits entire life. We have a thing that I, I, I have a phrase that we're like the only thing that people care about are kitties and titties. Um, <laughs> those are the only things that you can raise money for are super easy. All you have to do is put up a hey, we're looking for money and that's it. Like breast cancer awareness and um, and uh, you know these cats are going to be you know put to their death if you don't adopt them or donate now. And people will just. Like white middle class people will just drop money on those two things. You know, could be a children in a cage, <laughs> but like a cat in a cage. Oh my god, it's over. Okay. Don't like the kids in the cage? How about some cats? Here we go. Some yeah. Sarah McLaughlin music over that, and then it's all over. Just money, money, just big <laughs> world. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Ron left us, but I was going to ask him if he had any pet pet pictures or whatnot, but. Uh, it doesn't seem like it. Uh, Zach, you know, do you do the nice, you know, you, you do the cinematic stuff. You shoot the take, get the big glass and the big cameras and shoot some awesome photos of your pets. Yeah, I have fantastic. Um, every year I, I have like an entire catalog of hard drives of photos of my dogs. <laughs> nice. I have, uh, I have 200 acres behind me and it's really gorgeous land. Um, and like, so during the fall, it's gorgeous. And we have like trails in the back. So like, you know, once once a season, what I try to do is bring out my dog and like get photos, you know, when the light is right and everything like that. So that I have like I probably have from like maybe like four on I have like um, like this level, you know, this 
like award like dog photography kennel club these these this level sort of photos of of my dog and also my aunt's dog i have some the irish wolfhounds are really like amazing when they They are and i have some ridiculously amazing photos of doing the when you see with the telephoto and the big snowflakes are coming down and you freeze the snowflakes in the air like um I'll have to see if I can dig up one of the photos and we'll post it on the thing because they're just like they're literally probably among my favorite photos I've ever taken. <laughs> and it's of my aunt, not the Irish wolfhound she has now, who likes to try to chew on the camera more than anything else. Um, <laughs> she's kind of wild. Uh, but the Irish wolfhound she had beforehand had really long hair. And when it ran, it was just, yeah, anyway, but yeah. <laughs> the best shots I have my dog, I went to a dog park a couple of times. And, you know, just let her go and do her thing. And she would run away and run towards me. And, you know, always got some beautiful shots of her uh, running. And nowadays, whenever we go to the dog park, she just kind of hangs near me all the time. So I can't get those nice, pretty shots because she isn't running around with the other dogs. So, you know, I haven't I haven't shot anything much, uh, you know, of her in action. But maybe this will inspire me. I'll, I'll submit yeah. for next year's contest. <laughs> I had better glass and better cameras back when, because, uh, um, oh, God, what camera would have been 10, 10, 12 years ago? What, D, not D70, D90 or something? Um, uh, but I wish I had more professional glass back when my Border Collie was, like, she's she was like a Frisbee dog. Like, she'd jump up in the air and catch it and do the, you know, occasionally do a flip. She didn't land on her head. She's also totally awkward. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But, like, she was that sort of, you know, the Border Collies you see in movies and things like that. Like, she was kind of that level uh, before her, her, her hips started going. Um, but, uh, who, by the way, she is still alive. Okay, everyone? <laughs> Stop trying to kill her. <laughs> but anyway, but, yeah, I, I don't have any good photos of, of like, that. that I, I, I wish I did because uh, um, that would be nice. But, uh, yeah, I still have, like, I, I don't know. I mean, like, these aren't. The, the weird thing with these photos, though, they're not amazing, you know? Yeah, they're I, not like I, super-duper they all, action. I mean, I guess they're all – are they all just uh, – I'm trying to find where the, the bio, like the info is. Are they just submitted photos? Um, like other than literally the special mentions one, which actually is a quite nice photo of the, uh, uh, I think, English setter or, or, or Cocker Spaniel. Uh, running through the uh, uh, running through the flowers there, like other than that photo, everything else kind of looks like yeah. No, I probably somebody with a you know an iPhone 10 probably could get it pretty get those photos pretty well. <laughs> but yeah. oh yeah, they're all pretty sedate. Um, all right, well let's uh, let's end this week's show. Greg, is there anything you'd like to uh, highlight, present, steer us towards oh, any of your work I don't know. besides your Instagram? Yeah, uh, yeah, I just came off of that sound symposium stuff and I'm probably just going to hang around the island here now and uh for the next few weeks i'm off to ottawa in august for a week and uh other than that you know just carry on it's uh it's the way it goes nice nice uh, anything you with you zach um i have uh in a couple weeks i have uh charlotte's or not charlottesville but uh unite the right to excuse me uh down in washington dc the the same crowd that did charlottesville um, the the right wing and you know white nationalist groups uh, are now having a protest uh, or rally across the street from the White House in Lafayette Park. Oh. Uh, so that's going to be interesting, considering half of those people um, have death threats against me, and I put away a bunch of their friends in prison thanks to my photos. <laughs> it's, uh, that'll be interesting. Wear, also, wear your helmet. Also, it's uh, right across the from the street from the white house. So, <laughs> but, uh, oh, but yeah, which is why hopefully tomorrow, hopefully tonight or tomorrow, I'll have a post up on, uh, around the lens and visu.news, um, talking about all the things that you should have or you should consider having, um, um, if you want to cover this, this kind of the violent, like kind of the way that protests have really become like your regular yeah. protests now can turn very quickly into a violent thing. That used to not be a thing. There would be a lot of big, you know, WTO in Seattle and, and you know, um, there's there's a lot of big incidences, but it was like one or two a year, maybe tops if you really, really covered these things. Now it's like 12 people in a 
12 people protesting, you know, 12, you know, senior citizens protesting turns into somehow a riot nowadays, uh, whether it be because of the police or because of the uh, counter protest, whatever. Um, but uh, I'm putting together a list of kind of everything that you might want to consider having with you. Every, obviously, you don't need everything that I put on the list. Otherwise, you'd be carrying uh, a 150 pound rucksack probably with you. <laughs> You need to have interns with you to carry everything, but uh, but yeah. So uh, check out that in the, the next day or two. All right. Uh, I recently oh. shot an air show uh, near where I live, and I'll post some of the pictures up on the AroundTheLens.com website, so you can go all look at my pretty pretty photos of the Blue Angels doing their thing. Uh, air shows are fun, um, but you know it's always trying. It's all the challenge I would say in, in shooting an air show is trying to get something. Besides just the pretty shot of the aircraft in the air, because everybody can get that. And there's people who have a million times better shots out there already than what you have. So always trying to find that context, you know, with the aircraft in, in the foreground or the background. So I, that's why I tried to get in a couple of the, you know, just pretty shots of aircrafts and contrails. But always, always hoping for the, the plane crash, just like at any NASCAR yeah. event, you're hoping for the car crash. Because no, anyways. no plane crash, because then we'd have no. to respond to that. And we, oh, to be, oh, I forgot. To Sorry. Do, you know, <laughs> Sorry. There'd be a Sorry, lot of, literally... be a lot of media attention. I forgot that you'd be the people, you know, the people who were probably in the plane or something like that. So yeah, I apologize for that. <laughs> no, I mean, it wouldn't know them, but we'd have to, you know, deal with the media and all that fun stuff. So yeah. anyways, but no, thankfully no accidents. And uh, I hate you know no accidents ever at air shows. They're all all should be nice and, and friendly. But but no, I just shoot the shoot the air show for the fun of shooting an air show. It's always great to see what they do and always great fun stuff. I enjoy air shows just for what they are. But anyways, I'll throw some pictures on my website. Uh, Greg, I want to thank you so much for taking time out to be with us on our show. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Pleasure as always. Great. Well, happy Thanks. to have you. Always welcome back on. And uh, make sure you get some sleep because you look tired. It's kind of late out there. <laughs> It's been 10 days, 24-7. I do need a nap. Nice. Oh, jeez. All right. Well, for Zach Roberts, I am David J. Murphy. This has been Around the Lens, episode 134, and we are out.